Good morning, everybody. This is Mr. Linares. I'm going to be helping you guys out today with the um, RO project for engine oil light on. Okay, so this is just a um, something helpful, some extra advice as well for customer service and dealing in the automotive industry. So um, a little bit of both and then help you out with the actual writing of the RO. So first, some things to consider and then uh, help you work on the repair order itself a little bit, okay? So um, first things first, when you're dealing with a repair situation uh, as either a service tech, as a service writer, and also as the customer, okay, if you're on the other side of the uh, desk, as it were, um, the big factor when you're dealing with the repair is money versus time, okay? That is like the, the thing. Of course, the customer wants to get their vehicle fixed, but in order to get it fixed, they have to consider money and time, and they're usually... Um, they can be at odds with each other sometimes, okay? I mean, if the vehicle um, is maybe the cause the family's got five cars or something like that and they can spare one and oh well, it takes what it takes to, to get it fixed, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, I would wager that most folks usually can't go without their car for terribly long because there's only one or two in the family um, and it is critical to their use, okay? Same with same with businesses, okay? Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to go for the general effect here, not any special situations, okay? Um, but first, when you're dealing with service, any service industry at all, okay? If there's a profit motive for survival, this applies, okay? Maybe not for the public sector, and I'll explain that as we go along, okay? Uh, public sector generally means people working for a government agency of some kind, one kind or another. Um, you know, or, or even sometimes even charities and things like that. So basically, if you're getting the service for uh, just minimal fees or low cost, even free sometimes, right? Um, what we're talking about is mostly profit motive, meaning it's a private business where the cash flow coming into the business means everyone's survival. So when I say profit, I'm not talking about greed profit, where, you know, people are trying to swim in money. I'm talking about being profitable so everyone in the business survives. Okay, you know, from the, uh, the the owner of the business on down to the newest employees. Okay, so here we go. The first thing I want you to consider is this thing called a service triangle. All right, so this service triangle comes into effect in um, most profit motive businesses where there's a service uh, involved, okay, or something being produced for somebody. You have got time, quality, and the cost involved in these things. Okay, and it's a bit cynical to say this, but more often than not, it's true. The rule is you could pick two of these things, okay, generally speaking. That means if it is fast and it is cheap, you will not have good quality. If it is fast and good quality, it will not be cheap. If it is cheap and good quality, it will not be fast, okay? That seems to be too often true in situations, okay? People always try to find balance with these things, all right? Now, a good shop, a good operation, a good service provider, regardless of the kind of service they're providing, is going to try to get this thing landed in the middle as close as they can, okay? So this is going to wander in all of these directions. It will, okay? There's, there's no doubt about it. There's always something that's going to eat time. There's always something that's going to cost more, okay? There's always something that's going to threaten the quality of the repair, you know, based off of the capability of whoever's providing it, the quality of the parts they're putting in, any number of situations that could happen uh, in the environment that the work is happening in, like in an auto shop, okay? Time can be threatened by a wave of customers that comes in, you know, for little knickknack repairs and you just want to get them, uh, get them done. Parts holdups, waiting on the customer to answer a phone call, waiting, waiting for the service drive to answer a phone call, okay? Sometimes these things happen. Waiting for the tech to come back for lunch. Maybe the tech gets sick. All kinds of things happen, okay? quality can uh, suffer because maybe you get a uh, batch of bad parts 
maybe there's technician competency levels that come into play. Okay. Uh, it could even be a situation where um, the customer and the service rider can't come to a solid agreement about how to fix the vehicle and, you know, um, the best repairs aren't chosen. Any number of things come into play. Money, that's as flexible as the labor rates, um, the amount of time put into the car and as far as labor hours go, and even um, the cost of the parts, okay? So this, this is wildly flexible, okay? So is the time, okay? All of these three factors do work together to make a good repair, and ideally, you're trying to land that thing right in the middle if you can, okay? If at all possible, find a good balance of everything. So keep these things in, in mind, all right? Now, the vehicle that we are dealing with, just as a reminder, because uh, we don't have the, uh, the document sheet pulled up right here, and I'm not going to burn up a bunch of time doing it. We have got that 08 Ford Ranger, 2.3 liter, okay, rear-wheel drive, manual transmission, okay, and we talked about it being a courier, a messenger vehicle, if you will, okay? Now, keep in mind this messenger vehicle, this little 2.3 liter pickup truck, the little pickup truck, little, little putt, 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 right? Um, it's working to make the money, okay? Very much like a UPS truck, FedEx truck, um, you know, uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, all right? And any number of things, it has a fleet of vehicles or a vehicle itself is, is the business, Okay, like when I was doing my inspection work, my car, man, it was it was part of me making money because I had to travel around everywhere to go to do uh, get to my uh, my um, my business. Okay, so I was going shop to shop to shop, inspecting things. Um, in terms of uh, fleet vehicles, sometimes you have a massive fleet: FedEx, UPS, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vehicles. Okay, in a given area, or police, or fire, or something like that, where there's fleets. Of vehicles sometimes the courier vehicle maybe like this one or a little courier service it could be jim bob's courier service and the only person operating it's jim bob right um so uh it it varies either way this truck is making money i want you to keep that in mind during this entire process it's not just you know you need you know uh, some some uh, some fellers little beater to go around town in it's a working vehicle, okay? So when we talked about it being beat up, we talked about the high mileage on it, we talked about its condition, that it hasn't been taken care of, okay? Even so, it's a working vehicle. That means it's making money. It is the tool to make money. Consider that, okay? So as we go along for the different repairs that you can pull off, and given the situation we had with the oil light on, Okay, and uh, found low oil pressure. Since you found low oil pressure, you said, hey, I need to go look and see what's going on with the oil pump, see what's going on inside the oil pan, see the oil condition for real, not just on the stick, okay, which was low and black and stank, uh, burnt, okay, smelled burnt. So you pull up a pan and you find the oil sludgy, what's left over, right? And then there's metal in it. So metal in an engine, generally speaking, okay, the first point of wear is usually the bearings, usually, but we don't know that yet, okay? We just know there's metal there, okay? We also have knocking happening. So a lot of metal in there, knocking sound. My knee-jerk reaction as a technician is to say, oh, bearings, okay? And I see the sludge. Well, that's oil. Well, if I have sludgy oil and metal, okay, I know that oil travels all through the engine right? So if oil is traveling all through the engine and it's sludgy, it's nasty, and it's got these metal particulates in it, that means the sludgy oil and this metal have been traveling through the engine potentially, okay? So we're looking at the, bear, the you know, main bearings, the rod bearings, the valve train, okay, going through the oil passages, going through the oil pump, all of these things, we have got this mess going through. How much do we want to try to fix versus replace? That's the big uh, big thing we're going to be worrying about here, okay? 
So the first range of repairs that we're going to talk about is a piecemeal repair, meaning you do a little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. Okay, it can be very, very frustrating. Repairing the bare minimum, part by part, they may not include full teardowns. Okay, so that is perhaps you say you see um, all that oil, sludgy oil and bearings and you say, hmm, I'm just going to go ahead and clean it out and replace the bearings. Okay, and um, as long as the bearings and crank match up okay, you know, you measure them out and you say they're okay with inspect, I'm going to call it a day. Well, hey, that, that, that might work, okay? It's a dice roll. It's a hell of a dice roll, okay? But it might work. But then there's a high chance of comebacks. So you have this comeback problem. So it comes back later, and then maybe it's a valve problem because that oil and sludge and metal and everything, the oil, sludgy oil and metal, have traveled in places where, well, wow, now it's affected the lifters. It's affected the cam bearings. Okay, it's a, it affected the cam lobes themselves. We don't know, but now we know. So now you do a bunch of valve trim repairs. Oh, okay. Well, you go ahead and you do that second round of repairs. Okay. And then you realize after you're done, ooh, my oil pressure is getting really, really sketchy. What's going on? Okay, well, you realize that all that crap had gone through the oil pump too, and they ate it up a little bit. So now you end up doing an oil pump. And then maybe there's a timing issue over and over and over again. These things happen customer back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with this customer. There's no way they're sitting there sitting in the middle of that triangle at this point. Okay. They're going to be upset. Okay. Because their car is consistently down. This truck is consistently down for this service. Okay. That means he can't provide his service there. That means that screws up his triangle. All right. Now, granted, this thing was a not very well cared for vehicle, <laughs> okay, when it came on in. So, you know, how well was this guy taking care of anything in the first place? We don't know. Maybe this vehicle was ran this hard because he had to in order to keep the business going because maybe he needed to just pay the rent. We don't know. We don't know, okay? So you have to kind of limit that kind of judgment, but it does feed the conversation, Okay. So these piecemeal repairs, they also have a high rate of comeback. There's a low quality and reliability rate overall for the repair. Multiple labor operations, higher parts counts over time, okay? So to start off, maybe you start off with six uh, hours at 100 bucks an hour, $200 in parts, but you don't know how this is going to stack up over and over and over again into other repairs, okay? So you compare this great question of how far and how deep does this go compared to other repairs. The second kind of repair we deal with in a situation like this would be an engine rebuild, okay? So you have the engine rebuild, but it repairs, quote unquote, the whole mess. It's a complete teardown, cleanup, and a specification comparison of all the parts, okay? Uh, and, you know, basically end up fixing if you needed to fix anything, okay? Removal and repair. I'm sorry, removal and replacement of bearings, gaskets, and rings, and the hard parts, okay, the hard parts, that would be the cylinder head, the blocks, the pistons, connecting rods, okay, the stuff that isn't a gasket or a um, bearing. The hard parts would get checked out at a machine shop, okay, not just the measuring that you would do in the shop, you know, for flatness and making sure that the various diameters are okay, but are there cracks, you know, in anything, is anything, um, is there anything hiding as far as failures go inside where they can they can look at it with um, uh, chemical checks to see cracks and pressure test it in a special way to see if there's anything going wrong internally inside of these components okay it could be expensive this typically doesn't happen unless the specs comparison really fails hard okay because they want to see if they could recover these parts right but you know sometimes it happens sometimes it doesn't Okay, basically, if the hard parts come out okay, generally speaking, it's not going to go to a machine shop, okay, and get uh, get uh, worked over. Okay, if the spec comparison doesn't pan out, they're only going to send the parts that that don't come out okay. Usually, it's like the cylinder heads are a little warped or something like that, and they'll go mill them down and make them perfectly flat again or something like that. Okay, um, so that's a little bit of a question mark thrown in there. Okay, but for our purposes. We're going to say that the hard parts are okay, okay? 
it's got a high chance of success with competent tanks, competent techs working. Okay. It's more reliable than a piecemeal repair, but it is more expensive. Okay. From a labor standpoint, but it does involve one single labor option and the parts generally come as a kit. So you're kind of wrapping the whole mess up into one thing. Okay. So, so let's say you got 15 hours of labor at hundred bucks an hour. So 1500 bucks and then $400 for the kit. Okay. So you're looking at a $1,900 base cost and you got to throw in coolant and oil and things like that in there. Okay. But I'm not, not really too worried about that at this point. Okay. I just want to kind of get these ideas across. So yes, this is more expensive on its face, but when you compare it to the piecemeal repair, how do you think that would add up? Okay. I can almost guarantee you going in and out, in and out, in and out of a car a couple of times it will blow this cost right out of the water. Okay. So this is an improvement over the potential situation the piecemeal repair would be. Okay. Keep saying okay a lot. Sorry about that. Lastly, we have this engine replacement. Okay. Now, as a technician, been working plenty of decades, okay, doing this. The engine replacement repairs the whole mess. It replaces the engine as a unit, as a part, okay? Given the oil sludge and the metal that was found in there, this is what most techs would go for. They would look at it and go, I ain't touching that mess, okay? Because they have to care for that magic triangle that they have. It's not a personal pet project, okay? There's no emotional connection with it usually. So they're going to go for what is the most efficient way to get the customer happy, get their needs met as a technician, earning money, and keep the shop in the black, meaning cash flow, okay? Uh, keeping that happening as best they can. This is the most reliable option out of the three, okay? Unless the technician happens to be a competent engine rebuilder, okay? Which once you get practice at it, not the hardest thing in the world is bait for basic stuff, okay? So this engine replacement, just like the engine rebuild, it replaces, repairs the whole mess, but it replaces the engine as a unit. So you're not disassembling the engine. It has a very high chance of success with competent and novice technicians, okay? So new technicians can approach this much easier than the rebuild, okay? because they're literally just changing one big part, okay? Takes time, but they can do it usually, okay? It's not uncommon for a novice technician to be a helper for operations like this quite a bit. It is the most reliable pair, but it is also, generally speaking, more or even the most expensive out of the options. Likewise, with the rebuild, it is a single labor operation but the parts generally come as a kit. You're going to get the engine and all the goodies you need to, to, to install it typically, okay? There are certain situations where you just get an engine block and you got to tough it out the rest of the way. But uh, generally speaking, you'll get some kind of kit with your engine, engine uh, replacements. I'll talk about that right now. Okay, so let's call it about 10 hours of labor at 100 bucks an hour, but the parts thousand to three thousand bucks depending on how hard you want to play right if you have a used unit it's like from a junkyard salvage yard like lkq or the like pick apart you can find one for around a thousand bucks but maybe you're only going to get a 90-day warranty and the quality of this engine and survivability is very questionable very questionable okay so this is an option to help solve a lot of problems really, really quick, not causing too much trouble for the shop, but it is still a bit of a dice roll. This is a common option for folks that don't have a lot of cash to spend on their vehicle, okay? Um, now looking at the situation we're in with the oil light on and the poor condition of the vehicle, but the vehicle's a working vehicle, I wouldn't be surprised if a customer wouldn't pick this option in this scenario just to get the vehicle back on the road cheap, back to making money. Okay, because the next options would eat into profit really, really hard, even worse than this. Then you have a rebuild unit. Okay, now this is not a rebuild unit that's done in the shop that's replacing the engine. This is one that they buy from like a parts house or a rebuilder. Okay, and maybe you get a one year warranty, 12,000 miles. 
okay, one year, 12,000 mile warranty with it. And we're going to call this okay. It is a middle of the road risk. Okay. And if that rebuilder has been in business for a while, chances are you're going to get a good rebuild. Okay. So that's something to consider right there. This remanufactured one though, high cost, 2,700 bucks, 3,000 bucks. Okay. It can, it can get up there sincerely like wow but this comes with a manufacturer's branding typically ford motor company or motorcraft in this case because working on a ranger right um and they bring these engines as close to oe spec original equipment spec as they possibly can they're really gone through okay it's not just like a rebuild Okay, where it's some other person doing this up the same operation you would have done it is a remanufacturing where everything gets cleaned perfectly, repainted, pressure tested, all the parts get checked out the spec. What's not the spec gets replaced. Okay. Generally speaking, they'll run these engines a little bit and make sure that they're okay before they put them into service, that the oil pressure is okay, that the cooling system is gonna gonna hold up as far as the engine goes anyway. Okay, and then they have good airflow, everything, right? It's um, it, it's expensive for a reason, because you're usually going to get a long warranty, say maybe three years, hundred thousand miles in some situations. Okay, it is the best option. Oops, I didn't expect for that to happen. It is the best out of these options. It is the most expensive out of these options, but it is the thing okay that will give you the highest rate of quality the fastest solution to everything okay um but costs wow they're high so you negotiate that with the customer okay and say hey if this vehicle is making a ton of money for you this might be the way to do it if you never want to come back and see me again but you're going to have to change the oil you're going to have to care for the vehicle to keep this warranty going and prevent yourself from coming back to see me under circumstances like this. Because there was a bunch of simple oil changes over time that could have prevented the situation from happening in the first place. Okay. So at the end of any of these repairs has got to come that conversation. If you don't want to see me again, you got to take care of the truck. Maybe make a deal with him. He's a courier. He's got a business. He's got a schedule. So you make a special Saturday option for him or something like that and say, hey, uh, Saturday morning, first thing, bring the vehicle to me, okay, you know, every every 3,000 miles because you're running it really, really hard, okay, and then, um, you know, we'll give you an oil change, but we'll give you a discount if you keep coming to us or something like that. Maybe, okay, maybe he'll realize that keeping his vehicle running better will keep his operation running better. Conversations you got to have with your customer, right? Okay, so let's put that part to bed for right now. Let's go look at our repair order to see about our options and what's gonna happen, okay? So here we go, here's our repair order. So this is open in the Cami app. Okay, I kind of changed the document a little bit. Yours is gonna look the way it's been. I just changed this today, okay? So you've got your customer's information block, you know, Mr. Seymour, butts on Drury Lane, the vehicle information, the VIN, the date that came in, who wrote it, the number, the business, the phone number, the license plate number, the mileage, technician, you know, how they're going to be paying for it. All that's, that's easy. That's the easy part. Okay. But we have to remember, first comes the customer's information. Then comes the customer's complaint, oil light on and engine knocks. After that happens, you have to negotiate. We need 150 bucks to find out what was going wrong, wrong with the vehicle. This money here is an estimated cost for teardown and reassembly. Okay, based on this diagnosis, okay, being, I mean, based on getting an initial diagnosis, you know you're going to run into trouble. The minimum of 150, the customer is going to be deal, uh, work, um, authorizing to get the answers they want. So they sign and they date it. There's also another signature here and another date here to you just touch the car, okay? So both of these work together to let the vehicle um, be in the shop and worked on, okay? They are two separate things. You want to save the old parts or not? You would mark that. Estimated costs, we're not even adding anything else here yet. 
revised or esti uh, revised estimate or additional work. Nothing in there yet either. Nothing in these totals over here yet. Nothing over here in parts yet. We still have got to iron out the repair order. So the technician goes looking, finds the oil low in the dipstick. It's black, smells burnt. There's no visible leaks from the engine or signs of external damage. Great. The oil pressure reads at eight pounds per square inch. Spec is 25 pounds per square inch minimum. So basically you give what you found and you compare it to what Ford had to say about their, their pressure um, at the same time, okay? Now granted the spec, I just, I pulled that out of my head. I didn't go look before this. So that might be a little different on yours when you go look in the manuals, okay? Um, recommend removal of the oil pan for inspection or diagnosis, okay? Now, um, and, oh, you know what? You might want to add a little something here. I just noticed this. Silly me. Add a little note in here that the engine knocks at all speeds and it's RPM dependent. Okay, meaning the engine noise is going to go up and down with the uh, the engine speed. Right. Let's see. Let's get rid of the let's scoot this around a little bit here, y'all. Oop, oops. There we go. Sorry about that. You notice that there's no visible leaks, no signs of external damage, oil pressures at eight pounds per square inch, minimum is 25 PSI. And then you recommend remove all the oil pan for inspection and diagnosis because you don't have x-ray eyes. Okay. Hmm. Heck of a thing. We'd love to be able to pull off all of our diagnoses without, um, without any, uh, tear down, but sometimes we can't, especially with engine repairs or transmission repairs. A lot of times tear down has to happen. Okay. In this case, we're just removing the pan. Now, as far as the shop is concerned, okay, they want to minimize their initial expense with the customer because they don't want to scare anybody, but also they need to cover the tech. That $150 will cover the technician's labor for removing the pan and putting it back on and checking the oil pressure. Right? So at this stage, the shop's not playing the profit game. They're playing the cast out the line and let's try to reel them in, it, reel them in game, okay? So they give a little on the initial idea of profit to get the customer in and get them idea to see if the customer is going to play ball or not, okay? Um, and this, that's, I'm not, don't mean for that to sound like a, some kind of skeevy game or anything. It is a relationship you're developing and you're trying to develop a level of trust and assurance so the shop gives a little while the customer is on the shaky ground with expectations so far in the beginning, okay? So it's not a uh, <laughs> let's try to get them kind of thing. It is very much a let's approach everything very carefully. And, you know, we'll give, if you give us this trust for a little while, like that, that's the name of the game. So technician removes the oil pan, okay, at this point. They have the approval to remove the oil pan for diagnosis. And then, let's, let me... I'm going to type that and not write it because my, my writing is just not the best for this. Okay, so we've got the technician. Oops, sorry. The technician found sludged oil and metal particulates in the oil pan. Now, at this point in time, this is where the technician has got to make some kind of recommendation. This is where you go back to those three options, and this is where the technician has got to put their foot down about what their capabilities are, okay? Now, most techs are not going to go for a piecemeal repair in this scenario. Because of the sludge, because of the metal particulates, they're looking to go, oh, no, 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 that's just too messy. Okay, I know I'm going to end up seeing this vehicle forever if I start playing little games with it. Okay, so the technician comes around and says, hmm, 
rebuild or reman. Okay, so I do this. Tech recommends rebuild or replace. Oops, why can I never spell that word? Technician recommends rebuild or replacement of the long block. Okay. I I fed him. Oh. Okay. All right. I do apologize for that. So, um, the tech recommends rebuild the replacement of the long block, meaning the engine, okay? Usually engines after a while do not um, come complete valve cover all the way down to oil pan. Typically when you get a replacement engine, especially after the vehicle's been around for a few years, you get from the cylinder heads down to the lower end of the block and you're gonna be changing, uh, you're gonna be swapping over the pan, the valve covers, maybe the front cover, maybe, depends on the engine. Um, the exhaust manifolds, the intake manifolds, the, all the little sensors, the wiring, and all that kind of thing. Even maybe a few seals here or there, all right? It varies with what, what setup you get, okay? So the tech recommends rebuild a replacement of the long block. And what's going to happen at this point here? Using, I'm not going to type all three scenarios out here. It'll take, take three years to do, okay? So at this point in time, You've got to figure out what parts you're going to use. Oops. Sorry about that. Let me let me uh, let me erase this. That was a bad thing that did not come out the way I wanted. You've got the parts that you're going to use, the number of the parts you're going to use, the quantity of the parts. So you've got the quantity of parts, the parts you're going to use, the dollar value. Okay. Now down here you have got your total parts cost. That is all of these parts added up. Now, something we haven't talked about, which we will later, okay? The parts that you would be dealing with in a shop are going to have some kind of markup, okay? So at some point in time, we are going to be talking about how much profit the parts make themselves, okay? That comes into play a little bit later, though. But for right now, just whatever you see online, Okay, or whatever you can imagine for the parts costs is going to be totaled down here. Labor, you've got to figure out your labor costs. And you put that in the number of hours right here. And then, you know, we're, we're going to have a shop labor rate of 100. So you multiply it by 100. And then you come up with your dollar figure over in this area. And that's going to get totaled right here. After that occurs, you have an estimated costs for how much your parts are, how much your labor is, how much it's added up to be, okay, authorized by the customer, on what date, at what time, okay, and who called. This is usually the same person who wrote the repair order, okay, so it's usually the writer, phone number, whatever that might be, and it's typically by phone. Okay, something this big would be by phone. I doubt a customer would be hanging around all day waiting for their chance to get into the shop and wait for this in person. Sometimes the customer says, I want to see before I make up my mind. That's fine. You leave the thing out and let them see. Bring them on in, walk them back because they have to be accompanied in their shop. Okay, insurance reasons and all that. Show that to them. And then maybe they say in person. Maybe, okay? We're not playing those scenarios necessarily yet with our project. So after you get your approval, okay, and you get your signature on here, oh, well, not signature, you get the approval down here, that's when you come back in, back into the story. Oops. And let's just say we have engine replacement, okay? Engine replacement authorized. You just make a little note to that. Long, long block 
that has been replaced and necessary parts from old engine have been transferred. Oops. We I really wish I could type. <laughs> Okay, um, vehicle has been road tested at operating temperature. No additional. Concerns noted. Okay, now I'm sorry about the messy with the purple writing in there and everything, but that, that won't be there when you do yours. So you have the long block has been replaced, the or the engine has been replaced. You could even say that. Necessary parts from the old engine have been transferred. The vehicle has been road tested at operating temperature and no additional concerns are noted. Okay, not much more writing than say doing the uh you know, a, a leak diagnosis or a noise diagnosis or something like that at all, okay? But we have to make sure we write everything down. Now, if you were to do a piecemeal repair or a rebuild, all the little parts that have failed, all the little steps you took have to get listed down. We're talking second and maybe third pages of repair order, okay, to get everything listed down or even just type it out on a uh, in a doc, Okay, and staple it to the RO, okay, or something like that. You don't necessarily need to use this form at that point for the story. You just go ahead and add it in, um, you know, with a stapled document, or if it was electronic, you know, PDF it in or something along those lines, okay? And then when you're all done, you go ahead and you sew up all your totals at the very, very end, okay? So that's that. I hope it's helpful for your ideas that you got throwing around out there. Keep in mind, this is not the only way to do this, okay? Those other ways we talked about are perfectly viable. It's not a problem, and I would love for you to explore that kind of thing if you want to, right? This is just kind of the nature of how everything goes down. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, and so uh, that's that, and I will see you at the next meetup. Take it easy, everybody.